what is Islam? What makes up Islam? We'll talk about who are the Muslims, which kind of demographics we know about Muslims, what do they believe, what do Muslims practice. Then we'll talk about what does Islam consider a good Muslim to be like. Uh, we'll give you some criteria on those things. And I want to leave plenty of time for a few question and answer. Do feel free to ask questions during your presentation. Uh, we have until 7 o'clock, and I think I want to give you guys a free time for about 45 minutes. I want to give you a quick break to get something to eat or if you need to go to the restroom or something, you want to be there. Uh, but um, I do always encourage good questions. Uh, there is no such thing as a bad question, so do feel free to ask questions as, as we go along. Uh, with that, I'm going to start with an Islamic greeting that says Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be upon you or peace be with you. This is a universal greeting for the Muslims. So regardless of what language they speak, they would greet each other with this greeting of peace. Interestingly enough, from my discussions with my uh, Christian friends, uh, and, and the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, greets his disciple with this greeting. It says, peace be upon him, peace be upon him when he meets him. Uh, talking about Islam, and it's pronounced Islam with a soft S. Uh, if you say Islam, that's okay too, but now after this you're going to be an educated, really educated on Islam, so you just say Islam instead of Islam. Uh, so Islam meet, comes from two different root words. The first one is Selm, which means peace. The other one is Taslama, which means submission to God. So Muslims believe that Islam really means peace through submission to God. And Muslims believe when people submit their will to the will of God, they will be in peace in this life, with dealing with peoples and situations, they will be in peace in the hereafter as well. Uh, Muslim, because Muslims also believe in a second life after this life. So Islam is the name of the religion, and people are called Muslims. Again, with a soft S, not Muslim, Muslims. Islam meant submission to God, and Muslim means the one who submits to God. As you can see in this picture, we have Muslims from different parts of the world. We have um, African Muslims, Caucasian Muslims, Hispanic Muslims, Chinese Muslims. They are Muslims pretty much in every ethnic group and every uh, nation around the world. And Muslims make up, what we'll talk about, are Muslims make up a quarter of the world population. Uh, Islam is one of the monotheisms, or one of the monotheistic beliefs. And even more specifically, Islam is called an Abrahamic monotheism because Muslims believe in the one God, and actually Islam considers itself to be a culmination and continuation of the previous revelations that the one God sent. We'll talk about those more in uh, detail. Uh, here are some of the countries with high percentage of Muslims, so these are like 100% and then so on. So these are some countries with a high percentage of Muslim population, but, uh, and Muslims make up about, I think the most recent numbers are about 1.8 billion Muslims in the world is from 2011. Um, this slide might be more of a surprise to some of you at least. Uh, Indonesia is the most populous Muslim country in the world. Uh, we're about 200, over 200 million uh, Muslim population. So Indonesia is number one, followed by Pakistan, about 175 million, uh, followed by India, very close to Pakistan, close to 175 million, and followed by Bangladesh, and then Egypt, then Nigeria, Iran, Turkey, and then uh, Algeria and Morocco and other countries. So this is quickly a makeup of top few countries uh, that make up the Muslim population around the world. But there are Muslims throughout the world. We'll talk about those in a future time. So Islam has been in America for a long time, uh, as far back as the time of Thomas Jefferson. As well, hopefully we'll get a time to talk about those things. Uh, that there are some Caucasian converts who are here, that Thomas Jefferson had appointed him as an ambassador to go as an ambassador of the U.S. to different parts of the world, but also at least a third of the slaves, a third of the captives, who African captives who were brought here, they were African Muslims. So Muslims have been here for a long time. There's also a growing number of uh, uh, Muslims born, uh, uh, Muslims born to uh, immigrant parents. Uh, the estimates are about three and a half million Muslims in the U.S. right now. This is most of the, I think, pupil that have uh, about 1% of the population. In Minnesota, we have about 150,000 Muslims. I'm not sure what exactly the number is for Michigan here. I would imagine there are probably at least twice, maybe three times as many Muslims in Michigan as we have in uh, Minnesota. Here are some of the well-known Muslims. You might know some of these people. You probably know Dr. Oz. You might know Farid Zakaria from CNN. Uh, you might know that Keith Allison is our, one of our representatives. He was the first represent, Muslim representative in Congress. Um, uh, 
and then I'm sure you have some, we have, uh, we have a, a football player, some of the football players, you might know Iftihaj Muhammad, she actually got a medal uh, for the US team in the Olympics a couple of years ago, uh, and then other, of course, other uh, celebrity Muslims. I'm sure you know Muhammad Ali, I think everybody knows, well, most people know Muhammad Ali, I shouldn't say everybody. Um, and also, the, the next thing I wanna talk about quickly is about what makes up religion and what makes up culture. Rather than me telling you guys, why don't you tell me what makes up religion, what makes up culture? And I can wait, that's okay, I'll get some water. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Yeah. Could culture be like regional? Yeah, true, yep. Regional. Yeah, culture is regional, very good. What else? What makes up religion, what makes up culture? <laughs> Very good, yeah, so uh, mostly belief is going to be religion. Very good, okay. Anybody else? Would you say that, yeah, please come. Yeah, I, I would just, just say, I mean, if it's the Bible, the Bible, then it would be religion. Mm -hmm. If it's um, roles that came, you know, from digitalization, then it would be religion. Okay, very good, yeah, thank you. So, now if you were to talk about not just Islam versus culture, but any religion versus culture, would you say that the culture of a place would influence how they practice their religion, and their religion in some ways influences how they practice the culture, right? Now let's say if you were to imagine um, a Christian family, a Christian family here in Michigan, a Christian family in South America, a Christian family in Europe, let's say Italy or Germany, a Christian family in Africa, let's say Nigeria, and a Christian family in Vietnam or China. Even though they all have the same religion, they're Christians, do they all have the same culture? The cultures are very different, right? How they dress is different, how they speak is different, which kind of foods they eat is different, which kind of spices they use is different, which kind of perfumes they use is different. Right? So the culture part is different even though they have the same religion. Now the same is true for Muslims. Muslims who live in, in Indonesia, they have a different culture than Muslims in India, than Muslims in Afghanistan where I grew up, than Muslims in Iran, who's our next door neighbor, than Muslims in Somalia, than Muslims in Saudi Arabia, than Muslims in Germany, than Muslims in America. Even though we all have the same basic guidelines for religion, but our the cultures are very different. So the point being is that not everything that a Muslim does, it's not necessarily because of their, their religion. A lot of other factors go into what, why people do certain things and how they, uh, how, what, what they believe or what they think. Part of that is you know, their culture, their traditions, their politics. Some places they have tribes, they have tribal codes of conduct, all those other things. So it's not necessarily because of their religion. A lot of times when people talk to me and say, well, I heard this thing on the news, I read it on a newspaper about this. Why did Muslims do such and such in this part of the world? Most of those things that people find very problematic, most of them have nothing to do with Islam. It's because of people's cultural traditions, politics, and all those other things. I kind of like this picture. This is a, from our group. Uh, these are our friends, Kamal and Safiya. Kamal is a, 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 he was, he's Turkish. He was born in Turkey. He moved to Germany. He grew up in Germany. He met his wife, Safiya, in Germany. And Safiya is a convert to Islam, German convert to Islam. Their daughter, Nasreen, uh, was born and raised in Minnesota. Nasreen got married to Muhammad, whose parents are from Sudan. Okay. At their wedding, we had a mixture of uh, American, German, Turkish and Sudanese cultures. So everything you know, had so many different cultures, but it was very much an Islamic, an Islamic wedding. It followed all the guidelines of Islam, which was really great. So this is kind of a culture versus um, uh, religion. Any questions about that? Am I confusing anybody? Wow. <laughs> Thank you. That was a wow, right? <laughs> okay, good. So um, now we'll be talking about what do Muslims believe in. Muslims believe in the one God. We'll talk about God. Um, uh, Muslims believe in angels, the prophets, the holy books, uh, the day of judgment, and a divine decree from God. So these are the six main beliefs in Islam. When I teach my Sunday school students to make it easy for them, I tell them to say that, to think about this way. God sends the angels to the prophets to give them the holy books, and the holy books talks about the day of judgment and a divine decree. Okay, so these are the six main uh, beliefs in Islam. Uh, so Allah uh, 
is an Arabic name for God. Anybody speak Spanish here? You know how we say God in Spanish? Dios. Dios, very good. Anybody speak German or French or any other languages? Yeah, French. French, Dio and French, very good, yep. Uh, how do you say God in Farsi? Khoda. Right, they say, in Farsi they say Khoda. The way that Arabs say God, they say Allah. If you were to ask Muslim Arabs how you say God, they would say Allah. If you were to ask Christian Arabs how you say God, they also say Allah. If you were to read the Arabic Bibles, when it says God in English, it says Allah in Arabic. So this is Allah has an Arabic name, and Muslims believe Allah is the name of God. The name of God is Allah. And also Muslims believe that uh, God is, just quickly talking about God, just a few sentences, Muslims believe that God is infinitely loving, infinitely compassionate, infinitely um, uh, kind and forgiving, all knowing, all seeing, all hearing, and also, Muslims believe that God is beyond our imagination. You know, our intellects, our you know, of course, our intellects are created. It's not possible, and it's like limited. It's not possible for something limited to com comprehend something which is infinite. Right? So Muslims don't believe that we can understand what God exactly is like to have a shape or figure or, or form of God. So in Islam, there are no shapes or figures or statues. Uh, Muslims do not draw any picture to depict God. Muslims would write, so this is an Arabic, this is the way how you write Allah in Arabic. So they would have the names of God or the, some of the attributes of God, they would write in a very beautiful calligraphical way, but they would not have any shapes or figures or anything to depict God. And also Muslims believe that God is not a man or a woman. Uh, Muslims believe God is not a male or female or man or a woman, uh, which is the same as true for angels. Muslims believe they're also spiritual creation of God, they are not man or woman, uh, that the Muslims believe that there are, you know, countless number, infinite number of angels that only God knows exactly how many. Uh, the Muslims believe that uh, in a way they are like robots, they would do only what God tells them to do when God tells them to do. Uh, they don't have their own, unlike the humanity that we have a limited free will, Muslims believe that angels do not have a free will. Among the angels, Archangel Gabriel or Gabriel uh, is considered to be uh, one of the most, probably the most prominent or the highest ranking angel. And his title in Islam is the Holy Spirit. So if you read the Quran, when it talks about Holy Spirit, it's talking about uh, Archangel Gabriel. Uh, Muslims also, of course, Muslims only worship the one God. They would not worship the angels or the prophets. Muslims believe that the prophets were human beings, that they were the best, best, best of the humanity. That's why Muslims believe God chose them to um, bring the message of God to the rest of the humanity. Muslims believe that God had sent a prophet to all the nations of humanity from day one, basically, from the time of Adam, peace be upon him, until the time of the last prophet, who, who Muslims believe is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So Muslims believe all the nations at all the times they had a messenger or a warrior or a prophet coming to them. And basically Muslims believe all these prophets taught something similar. Basically, you know, that they taught that uh, monotheism, to worship the one God, and to only worship the one God, and then to be good, to be uh, to live righteous life. Uh, here are some of the names of the prophets that you might find familiar. Uh, only 25, even though Muslims believe that God has sent one narration says 124,000 prophets. Uh, only about 25 of them are mentioned by name in the Quran. So here is the name of some of them. Of course, Adam, we talk about him, peace be upon him. Uh, Noah, peace be upon him. Abraham, peace be upon him. Uh, and also, of course, Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them. And lastly, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad is not the only prophet. He is the last prophet in a long chain of the prophets. Actually, in one narration, he said that if you were to imagine each prophet like a brick in the house of prophethood, I am the last brick in the corner of the house of prophethood. He said that the entire house was complete. I was the last brick in the house of the prophet. And he also considered all the prophets, he would call him his brother. He would say like my brother Jonah, my brother Moses, my brother Jesus. He considered all the prophets like his brother. He actually said that prophets are paternal brothers from different mothers. So brothers from different mothers. Um, so that's from Kuki about the, some of the prophets. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
was born about 600 years after Jesus peace be upon him in the city of Makkah uh, when he was about 63 years old uh, Archang God sent Archangel Gabriel to him uh, to give him the message of Islam the message of monotheism and then he was told to go and teach and preach this message to his people who were practicing polytheism and then they got persecuted during the time in Makkah they even killed and um, uh, ex exiled some of the Muslims so they had to essentially migrate from the city of Makkah to the city of Medina which this is by the way marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar year they went to Medina they were actually summoned they, they were invited to come to Medina and he was given by the people he was given the leadership of the community there where he established the first Islamic state the first Islamic uh, uh, government uh, he, he died when he was about 63 years old uh, and also some spread afterwards after his uh, uh, death a few things about him he was uh, he was an orphan even before he was born his father had died before his birth his mother died when he was like five years old his grandfather died when he was seven years old and was taking care of him so he grew up as an orphan and then he uh, was living with his uh, uncle uh, and also uh, he was known even among the people who did not believe that he was a messenger of God even they knew him as the Al-Amin and as Sadiq, which means the honest one and the trustworthy one. Because they, they always knew that he had never lied his entire life, and he had never betrayed anybody's trust in his entire life. So he was known as the Al-Amin and Sadiq. And he was also unlettered or illiterate. He could not read or write. Uh, so Muslims believe for him to bring a book like the Quran, it's an even bigger miracle because an illiterate person could not have produced a book like the Quran. And also, if you look at the chronology of his life, he is very similar to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. He has a natural birth like Moses, peace be upon him. He has a natural death like Moses, peace be upon him. He gets married like Moses. He has children like Moses. He is also, he is not only the head of, of a messenger and a prophet for his people, as well as the head of the state and a judge for his people. So in many of those ways, he is very similar to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. Um, so Muslims also believe in the uh, holy books. We'll talk about Jesus, peace be upon him, later during the Q&A, uh, if that's okay. Muslims believe in the holy books that God has sent. Uh, Quran is obviously, Muslims believe, is the last revelation from God that God gave to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Before that, Muslims believe in the gospel, uh, the gospel of Jesus. People would ask me, is it Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John? It's, you know, Muslims believe in the gospel of Jesus, the gospel that he was teaching and preaching. Uh, the Psalms, the Torah, and even some pages given to Abraham, peace be upon him. So Quran is considered to be the last uh, revelation from God. Uh, so Quran was revealed, since Prophet Muhammad was illiterate, yeah, Quran was revealed as a, as a verbal revelation from God to Archangel Gabriel, to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and it came in small pieces over a 23-year period. Um, the Quran is in Arabic, and Muslims still read it in Arabic. Actually, Muslims believe that the Quran is only in Arabic. They would not consider the translation of the Quran as the Quran. They would call it the translation of the meaning of the Quran. Um, so it's only uh, in Arabic, and as you can imagine, uh, if you were to imagine a like a beautiful poet poem in English, right? Now, if you want to translate that to a, into a different language, you know, Spanish or French or German or something else, what you would do is you try to do your utmost to get the, the meaning of the poem, right? And then transmit it to, transfer it, translate it to different language. In the process, you will lose the beauty of it, you will lose the effect of it, you will lose why certain words were used instead of the synonym, synonym and so on. So Muslims believe that the Quran is only in Arabic, but they can read, a lot of Muslims would rely on translation also. Um, it's considered to be the last revelation. Let me see if I can play this. We have an audio for you, I hope it works. That's all right. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do it later. So that's what we have about the Quran. Um, 
And the Quran has a lot of stories about Adam and Eve, about the flood of Noah, about Abraham and his son, the Moses and the Pharaoh, uh, Jesus and his disciples. So uh, there's a lot of similarities between the stories in the Quran and the Bible, but they are not identical. There are also some uh, differences as well uh, between the stories. Uh, Muslims believe in a day of judgment. Uh, Muslims believe that the world will eventually will come to an end. and. Um, uh, Muslims believe that people will be judged for their beliefs and their actions. Muslims also believe in heaven and hell <coughs> after that. Uh, Muslims lastly believe in a divine decree. Uh, this basically says that God is the creator of all things. God has the knowledge of everything, the knowledge of the past, the present, and the future. And God has recorded everything which has happened and which will happen. So this is supposed to be about the uh, divine decree from God. So quickly going back to the beliefs, God, angels, um, holy books, prophets, day of judgment, and a divine decree from God, right? So those are the uh, six main beliefs in Islam. Any questions about those? Yeah? Um, I have a question about the, the Arabic, the Quran, the people are reading the Quran in Arabic. Are they reading it in the Arabic of the time of this? No, because well, the Arabic and the call like Fusha Arabic are still being uh, spoken today. Even though some of the dialects in different parts of Arabic, some of my Arab friends, friends can correct me. Some of the dialects in Moroccan uh, Arabic or Egyptian uh, Arabic is a little bit different than the Quranic Arabic, but the dialect is still spoken and people can still understand it. I call the Fusha or clear, clear Arabic. That's still spoken today. Do you have any good uh, parties here? Anybody can do a good uh, reading of Surah Al Fatiha or something? Do you have anybody with good voice? Yeah. Okay. Do I do it? Do you have a speaker? Uh, the, the runner will do a, 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 a recite for you the Quran, how the Quran is recited with a uh, good, good uh, recitation, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستغين إهدنا الشراط المستقيم شراط الذين أنأمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا so that's how usually Muslims would read the Quran in a recitation and the mosque, that's how they would read it. Um, any other questions about the beliefs quickly? We can always ask, we, have, we can have Q&A later, but any kind of clarifications on that? Yeah, so Good question. So Muslims believe that Islam, the religion of what we talk about, like you know, what you would consider to be the generic Islam, monotheism, believing in one God, and then submitting one's will to the will of God, has always been there. So essentially, Muslims believe that all the prophets before, they all practice Islam. They're all Muslims, quote unquote, with a small M Muslim or a small I Islam, right? Because they were monotheists and they submitted their will to the will of God. So Muslims believe that Jesus was a Muslim and his disciples who followed him, they are Muslims. Muslims believe that Moses was a Muslim and the people who followed them were Muslims. Muslims believe that Abraham was a Muslim and the people who followed him were Muslims. So Muslims don't believe that Islam is a new religion. You know, we can say that this is the last version of the same revelation from the same God that God had sent before, but it's not a new religion. So the religions have always been there. I have a comment about, uh, about the language of the Quran. The, the, the language used in Quran is the formal Arabic. Mm -hmm. Although there is, uh, there is now in, in different Arabic countries, there, is, there, is, uh, there are different accents, but uh, still the formal Arabic is used, uh, it's used formally. I mean, in communication, in, uh, in any formal uh, communication, uh, the formal Arabic 
The same same language used in Quran is used, still used. So like a written Arabic as well. Yeah. Arabic. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, so we'll talk about the five pillars in Islam. Um, five pillars or five main practices in Islam. The first one is called declaration of faith or, uh, or testimony of faith. We'll talk about that in each one briefly. The next one is the prayers. Muslims pray five times a day. We'll talk about those. Uh, the next ones are the mandatory alms or charity that Muslims have to give, fasting during the month of Ramadan, and pilgrimage to Mecca. So these are the five pillars or fundamentals in Islam. Uh, the first one is called declaration of faith or testimony of faith, or basically Muslims would say that I bear witness. They're declaring, I declare, I, you know, I declare that there is no God but God, that there is no other deity but the one God, and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And also Muslims, a lot of times, would have to say Muhammad is the messenger and the servant of God. To be clear that only God is worthy of worship and that Muhammad is just a servant of God and Muhammad is not worthy of worship. So Muslims do not worship Muhammad, peace be upon him, obviously. So this is the first pillar of Islam, which is considered to be the most important pillar. Everything else actually you know, stands on this. Muslims believe if you don't believe in this, the rest of the pillars don't count. So they have to believe in God, the one God, and then believing in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the last uh, messenger of God. And you know, obviously, Muslims believe in Jesus because of, through Muhammad. Muslims believe in Moses, through Muhammad. Muslims believe in Abraham, through Muhammad, or all the other prophets, peace be upon all of them. So technically, Muslims could say that I bear witness that there is no God but God, or no deity but the one God, and that Muhammad is the messenger of God, and that Jesus is the messenger of God, and that Moses is the messenger of God. But essentially, we believe in all of those because Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us that. Right? So they would, you know, I think this would just suffice for Muslims. Uh, the next one is the uh, five daily prayers, or maybe we should even call them to be uh, five times a day that Muslims worship. Because generally, when we talk about prayer, we, we, you know, we think about when we ask God for something. You know, God to give us to get an A if you are in a school, or to, get, to make sure that we, know, that we have good health or something happens. And generally, that's what people think when they think of prayer. But Muslims, actually, this is an official form of prayer, how Muslim, official form of worship, how Muslims worship five times a day. The first prayer comes before the sunrise. Uh, the second one is a little bit past noon, then mid-afternoon, after the sunset, and at night. So these are the five main times that uh, Muslims pray. And the prayers are, uh, start with, uh, and this is the beginning, so start with uh, the person standing. So maybe we just quickly explain this in case if you see people play, uh, praying on campus. So they would try to find out which way is northeast. Uh, now we have apps for those. They can just click on the app, it tells us exactly which way is northeast. And even, even Beepson tells us when is the time for the prayer. So it's a lot easier now. So let's pretend this is northeast. So before the prayer, Muslims have a ritual of washing, like an ablution, or more proper, uh, maybe uh, translation would be like illumination. They would wash up to be clean for the prayer. So they would say, uh, they would come if they are, at, like this person, if they are at home or at mosque, they would take their shoes off and pray without the shoes. If they're outside, they can also pray with their shoes on as well. Uh, so they would say, Allahu Akbar, which means God is great, or literally God is greater. So they would start with saying Allahu Akbar, and then they would close their hands and recite the first chapter that the brother recited, the, uh, the, uh, the opening chapter. They would say that in Arabic, obviously. So I should just tell you quickly what that means. I don't think we translated it for you. Uh, so it goes like this. It says that uh, in the name of God, the infinitely compassionate, the infinitely merciful. All praise and thanks be to God, the infinitely compassionate, infinitely merciful, the King and the Lord of the Day of Judgment, you alone we worship, and you alone we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, to the path of those whom your mercy and blessings were given to, not to the path of those whom have gone astray, and not to the path of those whom you, on whom your wrath or your anger was descended on. So this is the first uh, chapter of the Quran, which is recited in every cycle of the prayer. So this will be like one cycle. We start with uh, reciting the, um, sort of the, um, the first chapter, the opening chapter. They would bow down and say, Allahu Akbar. 
and they would say, Subhana Rabbi al Azim, Subhana Rabbi al Azim, which means glorified be the great God, glorified be the great God, three times. They would stand up and say, Allahu Akbar, and then they would bow down in prostration. Just like it's mentioned that Jesus, peace be upon him, prostrates to God. Just like it's mentioned in the Bible that Moses, David, other figures, they all prostrate to God. And they would say, Subhana Rabbi al Ala, Subhana Rabbi al Ala, which means glorified be the high and almighty God, glorified be the high and almighty God three times. They would sit down and then do a second prostration. And this would be considered to be one cycle of the prayer. And then they would stand up for the second cycle, pretty much similar to this. So prayers are two, three, or four cycles. So normally it would take somebody about five to seven minutes to finish the, most of the prayers. If they're at home, they have more time, they want to sp spend more time to meditate and focus on the prayers, they can make it longer. But generally, you know, the minimum is about five minutes or so. So it doesn't, even though Muslims have to pray five times a day, prayers are about five to 10 minutes, it's not that long. Um, and then, you know, and then usually after the uh, opening chapter, they would recite the different, different parts of the Quran, a few verses or another smaller chapter as well also. And then they can choose which one of those that they want to, uh, they want to uh, recite. And also the other thing is I usually get the question is so, do Muslims have a free form prayer? Can they just do ask God for anything? Yes, yes they do, Muslims do, we do. And that is called dua, or what Muslims call like supplication or invocation. Muslims can ask God basically, you know, in any, <laughs> in any good place, you know, obviously not bathrooms and things like that, but if, if they are driving, they can make dua. If they are sitting, they can make dua. If they're walking, they can make dua. That form of prayer is open. They can do it however they want to. They can talk from their heart to God. They can complain to God. They can ask, they can ask from God, all those other things. But this is an official form of uh, uh, prayer. But even within this, Muslims are told that they can still do, they can still ask God for something. Especially if they're making prostration after the prayer, using the other positions, they can ask God for different things within the prayer as well. Any questions about the prayer? <laughs> Good question. Uh, so each prayer is, like, I should mention that each prayer is, it's not technically by the clock. It's not like what the clock thing I have to pray right now. Each prayer has a window. Obviously, it's always best to do it as soon as the window opens. But each prayer has generally, I'm not sure how exactly, this, I would imagine similar. Each prayer has a, you know, at least a couple of hours window. Hour and a half or two hours of window. Except for the uh, sunset prayer, which is the shortest one. So they can have a couple hours to find a place to go pray, make it to a mosque, make it home, make it to a library, uh, or make it to like a Muslim businesses, they usually have something. So they can do that, or make it to like one of the conferences or something like that. So it's not like they have to stop right now, you know, the, the alarm is beeping, I have to stop my car in the middle of the highway, and I have to pray. So it's like they have some time to make these things up. And usually what Muslims generally would do is that they would try to schedule their day around the prayers. So they know what well, I have to do, such a, I have to go somewhere, but the prayer is coming up. Maybe I will wait until the prayer starts, I'll finish the prayer, then I'll go on a trip. Or maybe I know that the, the trip is gonna take me an hour, but I, I have an hour and a half time, then I can actually go do the prayer in between. Or I can stop, I can take a detour and go to this mosque along the way, um, then I can pray. So they, they have this stuff. Good question though, thank you. Any other questions? We talked about the prayers. Uh, a mosque or a masjid in Arabic uh, means a place of prostration. And so this is where Muslims go for uh, worship. It's kind of like, you know, uh, in Christianity we have church and in Islam there's a mosque. I usually tell people that a mosque is like a church without the pews. No, no, no chairs and without pews. People usually sit on it. The, they will uh, sit on the carpet, they will pray on the carpet. Uh, there are some chairs usually for people who cannot sit down or they have some knee or hip problems and things like that, but generally people would sit on the floor, they would pray on the floor. And, and, and that's why they, you know, one of the reasons they want to keep the carpet clean is because, you know, people would sit on the carpet. So if you go visit a mosque, you would take your shoes off before going to the, basically the sanctuary of the uh, building itself. This is a mosque that we have in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I should have put some mosque from uh, Michigan here, sorry. Uh, this, this is one from California. Uh, this is from Russia. This is from Uzbekistan. 
from China, from Afghanistan, from Malaysia, from Iraq, from Abu Dhabi. I would love to go visit this mosque someday. It's a really beautiful mosque. This is inside that mosque. So not all the mosque looks like this, by the way. So if you go, don't, don't keep your expectations that high because you'll be disappointed. And it's one of the best ones that I think they have around. So, it's like this. so the next one is, yeah? Um, are there certain rules for how a mosque needs to be built? Like is this a, I don't know what else to call it, congregation has to be of a certain size or, I mean? Well, the congregation has to be able to afford it. And they should have enough people, somebody to take care of the mosque. So if they, if they have enough people, they can afford it, they can have a mosque. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not required that they have to be specific size or anything like that, as long as they're financially able to, you know, to build it or to buy it and also to maintain it uh, for it to go. And also we want to make sure that somebody would be you know, in charge of the mosque, take care of it all those things. Uh, but also maybe I should have mentioned about other requirements. So having a, like a dome and a minaret, those are not required for a mosque to have. Actually, the first mosque of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not have a dome or a minaret. Uh, these things actually came later on as the community grew, uh, and the people were, a lot of people were in the building. So dome is essentially the way that it works is it amplifies your voice uh, before they had loudspeakers, right? And also a minaret is that somebody could go up, because Muslims have a call of the prayer they were called. They would climb up the uh, minaret and call, call of the prayer. So the, the higher you are, technically your voice travels further up. So uh, those were basically necessities or things that they could use in, in older times. And, and, and the mosque that I go to, we actually we bought a post office building. The post office was selling the building, so we bought the post office building, so we don't have a dome or a minaret. And the discussion we had within our board was, well, if you had a couple of hundred thousand dollars, we could build a dome, but would that be better to build a swimming pool or a gymnasium for the kids instead of building a dome, which is there's no functional necessity for it anymore. It looks beautiful, obviously, but you know, there's probably, you know, if we have the money, might as well invest it on the youth. So we had a long discussion on those things, but at this point, we don't have a dome in the middle. Good questions. Other questions about mosque or prayers or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, are your men Good question. So it usually depends on each mosque. I should say that about, about the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his mosque. The way it was is that they prayed in the same building, the same room basically. They did not have a barrier in between. They did not have a wall that was not separate. So the way that he said is actually said, you know, he was the leader of the prayer. Let's pretend this is the direction for the uh, Kaaba. He was the leader. They would have the roles of men, the roles of boys, the roles of girls, and the roles of women. And that's, and that's how they would pray. And so the, the, I should just mention here quickly, because I can find that uh, picture, is that as you can see, the Muslim prayer is, uh, very physical prayer, right? So it involves standing, bowing, prostration. One of the scholars actually said that the reason that men have to be in the front and women in the back is because of the weaknesses of men. If it was the other way around, if men were in the back and there were women in front of them and they would bow down and try to prostrate, they would focus up it. They would lose focus of their prayer by looking at the woman. So that you know, this is one of the one of the wisdoms of that is that men are in the front so they can focus on the prayer. And also, so they, they, and, you know, some of the mosques are different. They can have a, they would put a curtain in between. They have different rooms, or they have a like a lower level, higher level, or something like that. But at the mosque of the Prophet peace be upon him, it was one room. There was no barriers in between. So that's how they did at the mosque of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Um, good, good question. Other questions. Should what? it be facing the northeast, or you know, if they can? Well, yeah. If they are building it from basically ground up, they try to face it and, and, and toward the northeast. But if they are buying any building, they try to make an adjustment. So, so you know, maybe if that's northeast, they would make the corner to be that direction, and they would, you know, they put the carpet the way that everybody would know. Which is. But if you know, we have a couple of mosques in Minnesota that are actually building from the ground up, and they are you know, making it the way that it's actually facing towards the Kabla directly, towards the Makkah directly. Of course, in our building, we bought an already made building, so it's not possible for it to do. But you know, it's actually worked out really. I think we're only off by about our wall is about only two, de three degrees off 
from being the drug should not be used. So we ask one of the scholars, it doesn't matter. That's okay, just keep it like that. You don't have to change the direction of the wall. So we use that's what we did. Uh, the so the next one, the next pillar is fasting. Uh, Muslims uh, fast during the month of Ramadan, which is the lunar month. Uh, they abstain from eating, drinking, any kind of sexual activity, chewing tobacco, smoking, uh, during the day. When the sun sets, they can eat and drink again. So um, from basically before the sunrise, from dawn until the until dusk, or from dawn until the sunset, no eating and drinking. So, and Ramadan is a lunar month, and lunar months are about 10 to 11 days shorter than solar years. So, lunar months come 10 days earlier each year. This year, Ramadan is coming, I think, uh, May 15th, right? Is that what the time? May, May 20th, May 15th? So, uh, so it comes, uh, you know, last year was in June, it's gonna come a little bit earlier each year. I remember the first one I came to the US, I came in 1990. Ramadan was in, uh, in winter sometime. I think it was December or January, something like that. And I remember coming the first time when I fasted in, uh, in Minnesota. I'm like, wow, it's so easy to fast in Minnesota. I could break my fast at about 4.35 o'clock because during the December, January months, the sun sets at about 4.35 o'clock. I didn't realize that in 20 years, it's gonna change, it's gonna come in the summer, and, and the sunset is gonna be about nine o'clock. I'm not sure what it is for you guys now. About nine o'clock. So for us, it was uh, we are fasting from about three thirty in the morning until about eight forty-five, nine o'clock at night. So the summer makes it for a longer day, but then eventually it's going to go back to the shorter days. Also, the interesting thing is that every about every thirty years, Ramadan rotates throughout the entire year. So Muslims will be fasting, you know, each day at least once every thirty years. So if somebody lives about sixty years or so, sixty-seven years, they will be fasting each day of the year twice. Because it rotates 30 years of every days. Every, you know, it rotates every 30 years. Uh, so uh, Ramadan has a lot of benefits, uh, attaining piety, building willpower, feeling compassion, reflecting on oneself. Uh, but Muslims only do it because they believe it's a commandment from God. So this is about fasting. And also fasting is for healthy adult resident Muslims. So if somebody is, for the young kids, they don't have to fast. Somebody who is sick, they don't have to fast. Somebody who's traveling, don't have to fast. Uh, pregnant or nursing mother, don't have to fast. So there's some exceptions for people who cannot fast also, for healthy adults, resident uh, Muslims. Any questions about fasting? So the next one is pilgrimage, uh, or called Hajj in Arabic. Uh, Muslims who are healthy enough and wealthy enough, they are commanded to make a pilgrimage once in their lifetime. And for the pilgrimage is essentially in respect and remembrance of Abraham, peace be upon him, and his family. Uh, so Muslims would go uh, to the what is today what is today Saudi Arabia, city of Mecca. At that time, it wasn't called Saudi Arabia, obviously, right? So about three million people they would go to uh, the city of Mecca for pilgrimage. They wear very simple clothes, just like a white cloth. For men, wear usually men wear two pieces of white cloth, one for the upper body, one for the lower part of the body. Woman also wears a simple white clothing as well. So everybody looks pretty much the same way. And you cannot tell who is the richest person or who is the poorest person. They are all dressed as very similar uh, along the way. This is the house of Kaaba, and all these dots that you see, these are all people. So about, depends on how many visas the Saudi government gives, about two and a half to three million people usually would go to uh, pilgrimage. Uh, so this is a close up picture of the Kaaba, uh, the house of Kaaba. These are writing, this is a calligraphy, uh, a Arabic calligraphy embroidery on the curtain of the Kaaba. So the black is like a drape, like a curtain over the Kaaba. So uh, during the month of Ramadan, actually they would change, they would replace the entire um, drape also. Um, and also I should be, uh, mention that Muslims do not worship the building itself. The building gives Muslims unity and direction in their prayers but obviously they're not worshiping the building itself. They worship the one God. Um, any questions about that? Yeah. What's inside? Inside is empty. They usually have, they have a couple of pillars. They have, I think they have a table that they put on Qur'ans. Um, not sure what else they have there. Um, I don't think they have any chairs or anything. Um, they, there's some pictures on the internet. If, you, if anybody wants to Google it, you can find. But I think it's very simple inside. They keep it clean. They have some, it's like they have marbles inside and they have some, you know, obviously um, lights. Anybody else remember exactly what is inside? I don't think I have anything else inside the camera. 
I think you leave a copy of Quran and somebody would read it, but not the Nothing empty there. Could you elaborate on who, who built the Kaaba? Yeah, good, good point. So the Kaaba was built, Muslims believe it was built by Abraham, peace be upon him, and his son Ishmael, peace be upon him. So they are built the Kaaba as a house of worship for God. And it's actually, some have said that initially, initially, it was this was the very first house of worship built by Adam, peace be upon him. When God commanded Adam to build a house of worship, Adam had built it, and Abraham and Ishmael rebuilt it, and that's where it's Oh yeah, good Ramadan question. Or? Yep, it's called. It's actually called the month of pilgrimage, uh, and this is, it comes about. It's a lunar month. Also, it comes about. Uh, um, the season comes about two months after the end of Ramadan. So Ramadan, yes. Yeah, so. so and that also rotates throughout the year. So the next one is the Islamic holidays. There are two major Islamic holidays. The first one is Eid al-Fitr, which comes after the month of Ramadan, after the, the, the month of fasting. And the second one is called Eid al-Adha, which is a festival of uh, sacrifice, uh, which is after the season of Hajj of pilgrimage. And Muslims, in, in the memory of Abraham, peace be upon him, who was willing to sacrifice his son, Muslims who go to pilgrimage and also who, cannot, who do not go to pilgrimage, but they can afford to, every year they will sacrifice an animal for the sake of God, like a sheep or a cow or a camel, whatever they can afford to. And they would give the meat, uh, like a part of it, to um, the poor people in the community. A third would go to a third would go to the poor people, a third to the family and neighbors, and a third they would keep for themselves. So they would, this would be in remembrance of Abraham, peace be upon him, on a yearly basis, to remember the sacrifice of Abraham, peace be upon him. Um, so questions? So this was quickly about the um, beliefs and practices. So what I'm going to do about next is talk about who is a good Muslim, what makes up a good Muslim. But let's take some questions quickly. We'll give you guys a quick like five minute bathroom break or something. We'll come back. Is that right? Let me just take some quick questions. Uh, this is not really a question. I feel like we should uh, just start from the camera. Yeah, share the Oh, did I say? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so the zakat mandatory alms, Muslims are told to give at least two and a half percent of their savings uh, to the poor people. Um, generally, people do more than two and a half percent, but that is the minimum required. So it's not on the income, uh, it's on the savings. And also there's actually minimum requirement that you have to have so much before. You know, if somebody has, uh, you know, they, they, their minimum balance in their bank account never goes above, you know, 500 or something, they don't have to give anything. They can give some extra charity, but they would not, they don't have to give extra zakat. They have different, like, they call this off, and they calculate it every year. How much they so that's actually also part of faith to help the poor and the needy, uh, and two and a half percent is minimum. Usually when, I, when we do fundraisers in our community, we just had a fundraiser for uh, Rohingya and Burma, uh, we usually tell people that your Christian friends and neighbors, they do at least 10%, you should do at least 11%, right? So and a lot of people do a lot more than that, but this is two and a half percent is the minimum, which is part of the zakat, but what is called charity or sadaqah, that's way beyond that. Good question, thanks for your money. Um, so just uh, one question, I mean, so we have the Torah, uh, we have the NBA. Why do we leave uh, Quran, I mean, if we have these tools? Good question, you're giving me tough questions, you should leave it for the, for the guys to ask questions. <laughs> So, so Muslims believe that God has sent a book. Muslims believe when God sent the Torah, the Torah was sent to Moses, peace be upon him, for that time, for his people during that time. When God sends the, uh, the Psalms, God is sending it to, Daud, to David for during that time for his people. The same when, the, when God sends uh, the gospel to Jesus, peace be upon him, these are the books for that immediate area, for those immediate people during that time, right? And obviously you can imagine during those times, they could, the, uh, it was very difficult to travel, so it would have been hard for these books to be traveled, to be kept intact the way it's supposed to be kept intact and so on. So Muslims believe that as a last revelation, God sends the Quran, and the Quran, what makes the Quran unique is it's the last revelation of God. Unlike, unlike previous revelations from God, God has taken the responsibility of protecting it himself. So Muslims believe, believe that actually we have you know, evidence uh, that the Quran has not been changed since it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We have it the same way, we recite it the same way, has been transmitted the same way for the past 1,400 years. No human has 
No human has altered the Quran. No human has added to it. No human has subtracted to it. So when we read it today, it's not a hearsay. It's not like a telephone game that's gone through people, but that's exactly how, how it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and how he read it, how he taught it. And actually, the, the way that his brother read it is exactly how Prophet Muhammad recited it, and he told people how to recite it also. So Muslims believe among the miracles of the Quran is it has not been changed, among many other things. And also, we, maybe we can talk about it, I don't know if you want to talk about it now or later, is that the way that the Quran was compiled also was really amazing. Because for Muslims, there are literally millions of people who have memorized the Quran cover to cover in its original native uh, language of Arabic. Any, do you have any Hufat here? Anybody who has memorized the entire Quran? Most communities that have, at least have a one, one Hafiz who has memorized the entire Quran cover to cover. And they're like, and they're literally millions of people who, who do it. And also, the way that they do it is they actually go to like a, basically like a schooling for those things. They spend a couple of years and they get at the end and they keep on getting tested. And at the end, when they pass the test, they have memorized the entire Quran, they get them a certificate, and the teacher will tell them that I'm giving you this permission, this certificate, who was given to me by my teacher, by his teacher, by his teacher, by his teacher, by so many generations, like, you know, I think last person I talked to was like 27 people going back to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Right? So, you know, he was taught by this, by this, by this. So they have a chain of certificates going back. Now I'm certifying that, you know, you can have the certificate, you can go back and teach it. Or you can go lead the prayers. Because during the month of Ramadan, Muslims would recite the Quran, uh, like a 30th of the Quran. So every night, one 30th of the Quran, uh, every night by heart, and they would listen to it, and the rest of the community would listen to it. So part of it is that it was actually, the Quran was meant to be, unlike the other books that Muslims believe was meant for the people of that time, during that time, and God had not guaranteed to preserve it. Quran is a book that God had sent at the sixth century but God meant it to continue until the day of judgment, until the end of time. And God guaranteed it that it was going to save it. Good question. Thanks for that reminder. So any other quick questions before I give you guys a quick break? Um, I have one more. Okay, not from you. Let me use it. <laughs> well, uh, and you have our guests. We can come back and I can ask questions there too. Let's take a five minute break quickly. Get something to eat or drink and you know, uh, if you need to run uh, the rest of the we'll, we'll start in five minutes.